So out of reverence for God's word, let's stand. I'm going to be reading from the book of Acts, which we've been going through this entire summer, which is a history of the early church. I'm going to read from Acts 8, 1 through 3, and then I'm going to jump to chapter 9, 1 through 19. This is God's word. And Saul approved of his execution. And these arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Chapter 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to, uh, to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, Here I am the Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the high priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless this time. We ask that we would understand your word. We would be nourished by it. You say that we do not uh, uh, live by bread alone, but every word that comes from your mouth. And we ask that that we would live by it truly and honestly, that we would not only hear it, but we'd be transformed by it. We pray as we learn about Saul and his conversion, that we would be changed. We pray as we learn about your identity for Christians and your church, that we would uh, live out that identity, that it would be something that is not only known in our heads, but seen in our lives. All this we ask because you empower us by your spirit, and we know that you can change us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to start off this morning with a thought experiment, and the thought experiment uh, has to do with Las Vegas. Now, what is the famous saying when it comes to Las Vegas? Yeah, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That's the, that's the saying. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And when we say that, 
where we think about that, there are certain thoughts that come to mind. Of like, well, okay, what is happening in Las Vegas that stays in, uh, that stays in Las Vegas? But, so this is a thought experiment. Let's imagine everyone in Las Vegas this weekend and all the things that go on in Las Vegas. And I'm, I'm not saying that everything that goes in Las Vegas is bad, okay? Buffet, I like buffets. That's, 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 there are some really good things going on, like eating at buffets. But let's say every single person downtown Las Vegas was going about their, having their weekend, and every five minutes, they just pinched themselves and thought this thought, I am a husband, if they're a husband. I am a father, if they're a father. I am a mother, if they're a mother. Or I am my father's daughter. Or I am my mother's son. And that's the only thing they did, you know, that's, they just consciously thought those thoughts about who they are, and particularly towards their family. I am a husband. I am a wife. I am a, a father. I am a mother. Okay, if everyone in Las Vegas this weekend did that, every five minutes they stop and thought about who they are, do you think that Las Vegas would be different this weekend? I guarantee it would be. No, I'm not saying holistically. I'm not saying everything would just shut down. But I bet you could tell a difference if everyone just thought about who their identity was, and just in a familial way. The reason that's the case is identity shapes our actions. Identity shapes who we are. It just it really does impact the way we think about ourselves and, the, and who we actually are affects the way we live. Or if we want to get nostalgic for a moment and tap into some core memories, we could think of The Lion King. I'm sure a lot of us, and multi-generationally, Lion King was very impactful. And what does James Earl Jones say by way of Mufasa? Simba, you have forgotten who you are. <laughs> you know, in that deep James Earl Jones Darth Vader voice, you know, it's like, who you are. And for those that don't know, yes, Darth Vader is the same as Mufasa. There you go. It's mind blown. Okay, it's, and the whole thing is Simba's going away. He's living this, uh, this lifestyle that's just, just live however you want. Live however you want. And his father in the clouds comes back and says, you have forgotten your identity. And when he remembers his identity, what changes? Well, everything changes. He goes back to the pride land, and he fixes things. And what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the conversion of one of the greatest Christians in history. Up to this point, we've been talking about Acts, written by Luke and with eyewitness ac accounts, as the story of the early church. And that is true. It is the story of the early church. But starting here in chapter 9... We could also say that Acts is the story of this man, Paul, or Saul. It's like his story, and this is the start of his story. And as we look at the, his story and the start of his story, what we see are a ton of descriptions by Luke as he's recording of the, what the church is or what it means to be a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? In fact, he could have used the same word throughout this entire chapter, to just say believer, and that's one of the most common words for a Christian, believer or, or a Christian. He, he could have used that, but he, he just threw out this whole narrative talking about the conversion of Paul. He uses at least nine, probably, and I think more, of different words to describe what makes someone a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does that identity look like? So we're going to go through, we're going to look at this narrative but also, each time he gives a different word where we're going to reflect on what does that mean first for Saul, who's becoming a Christian, and then for us, as either we are Christians or the offer to become one is right in front of us. So this is what we see first. We're going to read verses eight, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 and, and 2. And Saul approved of his execution. This is the execution of Stephen, 
who was stoned. We, re- uh, we went through this a few weeks ago. He's stoned to death. Saul is there approving of it. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and there were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. So what started with Stephen expanded to the entire church of Jerusalem. So it's like the temperature of persecution just went up in the entire city. So it's not like the rocks were just picked up towards Stephen. It's like the rocks were picked up and just aimed at Christians. It's like, we, we want to... So Christians felt compelled to like, we need to leave. We, we need to flee or we're going to die like Stephen. So they, they go throughout the entire area, Judea and Samaria. And this is where Philip goes to Samaria and we see all the things that God does in chapter 8 uh, in Samaria through Philip. And, and we see other things. We're going to, as we continue to read through Acts, we're going to see more things based on the scattering. But the thing I want to focus on is who's the one approving this? Who's the one uh, perpetuating this? Well, it's this guy named Saul. He's the one that's approving of this execution and really perpetuating this persecution of the early church. Well, who is this man? Well, Saul are also called Paul. Uh, usually when people refer to him, they refer to him as Paul. One misconception is that he, his name was changed when he became a Christian. Who has heard that? Saul became Paul when he became a Christian. That is not true. <laughs> it's not a bad misconception because you see this all the time in the Bible. God changes people's names. The reason why he's called Paul is that's his Greek name. And the Hebrew name for that is Saul. That's the reason. So as you read, when he's in a Greek context... It's Paul, because he's in a Greek context. And we see this all the time. Like, um, I could be Jacob or Jacob. You know, it's like in different languages, it's a different name. And it's not like I did a name transfer. It's just a different language. And that's what we see in Acts, the same thing. He's Saul is his Hebrew name, and Paul is his Greek name. And he was born in Tarsus, which is in modern-day Turkey, but he's raised in Jerusalem. And he is raised in Jerusalem by Pharisees, by religious leaders. And not just religious leaders. He says that he was born in, as a Roman citizen, which is a very prestig- prestigious thing. In the same way in, Amer- in America, if you're, let's say, kidnapped in another country, as an American, you're in a much better place because it, it turns out that American citizenship is like worth something. So... They could, they are, the military could be sent in to take you out and to, to rescue you, Lord willing. It's the same thing in the Roman Empire. If you had Roman citizenship, it was worth a lot, worth a lot in that context. So he was religiously prestigious, born into a family of Pharisees. He's also culturally prestigious, born into a Roman household with Roman citizenship. He's also educationally prestigious. Says he studied under Gamaliel. Gamaliel, we learned about earlier in Acts, that he was the guy that says, hey, should we persecute the church? What if we find ourselves uh, going against God? And he trained under him. So, so this, is, this would be like in today's day and age. Not only was someone looked upon and revered in religious circles, but he also went to Harvard and studied under one of the great professors there. And he was born with, as we would say, with a silver spoon in their mouth. Very wealthy, very prominent. And then he says that not only was he in this environment, sometimes when people are born into a situation like that, they just become lazy. I I was watching a a documentary a few uh, nights ago, and uh, it was the son of this famous author. And he's also the, the guy that owns the world's largest private library. It's like 30,000 books. <laughs> and it's like, and he's, it's very obvious that he's the kind of guy that was born in with a silver spoon in his mouth that didn't take advantage of it. Because he's like, my grandfather gave me my first book. And he's like, no, I haven't read it. And I would always go to my grandfather to help me write book reports. And I'd always get A's on the por- portion that he wrote. And F's on the portion I wrote. <laughs> you know, it's just, and you're looking, you're like, really? You have at your exposure one of the great Italian minds ever. You know, 
and that's what you did with it. Well, Paul did not do that. It's, he says later in Acts that he was exceeded most of the people that were his age within the Pharisee tradition. He worked hard. He was very zealous. So he's very prominent, and then this guy named Stephen comes along and starts to best him and his friends in debate over the Bible. You know, and show him how his reasoning was off and his understanding was off. And here he's in a place of like, man, I, I'm the guy. Like, I, I've studied. I'm, I've been in all these circles of education. And here this guy that waits, ta- uh, waits on tables from within the church comes and he starts besting me. And then they end up stoning him. And that anger does not stop with Stephen. It's not one of those things that he's angry at Stephen and then it just stops. It continues. If Stephen is like this, more people will be like this. And it needs to be stopped. And this is what we see in verse 3. It says, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women. So it wasn't just the men that were being dragged off and put thrown into prison, physically harmed and hurt, but also the women, and committed them to prison. That's, that's what we see. That's what we see. Saul is the one doing this. Paul is the one doing this. But it's also where we see the first description of what it means to be a Christian. It says he was persecuting and ravaging the church. The first descriptive word, the church. What does it mean that Christians are the church? The church are, in the Greek is ecclesia. Or ecclesia, is, it's, it's pronounced both ways. We really don't know how ancient Greek was pronounced. It's like, so we shouldn't pretend like we do. But it's like, it means gathering, just gathering. In fact, in Acts, it's used to mean gathering of not just Christians, but just people in general. The church is a gathering. Christians are a gathering. This is who we are. Now, what does this mean by way of implication? This is one of the most common words that we use, the one of the most common words in the New Testament to describe God's people. What does this mean? This means that by definition, you cannot be a lone ranger Christian or a lone wolf Christian or anything, lone anything Christian. You can't, be, you can't be a loner Christian at all because to be a Christian means to be a part of his gathering, to be a part of a group of people. They come together by definition. And oftentimes we think we can live the Christian life autonomous, away from other people. And we think this because we are very short-sighted. For for example, we we think of if you go and you you see a, a beautiful rose bush and you cut off a rose and you take that and you put it in a vase in your house, in the moment it looks, look at a beautiful rose just standing there solo by itself. See, it can sustain. But it, a few days go by, and it starts to wilt. And it's not quite as crisp as it was. It doesn't smell quite as strong as it did. And if it continues to sit there, eventually it will start to rot and smell actually bad. And then you throw it away. You get rid of the rose. The same thing happens to a Christian's vitality when they try to be like, "Ah, I can do this by myself, and they try to go by themselves and say, "I, I can do this Christian thing without being a part of the church gathering, and that's just not true. That is not true. It's like a hot coal that is removed from the fire. Eventually, it'll get cold and not be a hot coal anymore. So that's the first descriptive word. We are the church. We are the church. Christians, we are the church. The next thing we see is that Christians are the body. And this is when we, we fast forward to chapter, or excuse me, uh, not the body. The next thing we see are Christians are the way. Uh, we're going to skip forward to Na- uh, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. This is what it says, but Saul still breathing threats and murder. We heard about Philip. We, we talked about Philip for the last few weeks, and then it jumps back to Saul. So Saul's persecuting the church, 
and we read about all these amazing things that are going on through Philip, and then it intentionally, Luke intentionally jumps back. He jumps back to Saul, and he says he's still breathing threats of murder. Meaning, all, even though all this time has happened, he is still angry. It's still festered. Time, you know, when we say time heals all wounds, that is not necessarily true. Time can help, but time alone will not heal anything. And so, and this is the case with Saul. Time has gone by, and it is not, it is still there, and it has grown. It has is, is continued to fester. He's breathing threats against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues, meaning, could you write and give me permission to go and do in Damascus what I've been doing in Jerusalem? So that he found any belonging, here's the phrase, to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. To the way. If you search this, you'll find that this phrase is used in Acts to describe Christians, the way. It's, it's not a, you know, unlike church, which we use normally, this is one of those phrases that we do not use really anymore. You know, in fact, if, if someone asks you, hey, so just tell me about yourself, and you said, well, I'm a part of the way, <laughs> they, might, they might take a step back or two. <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't know about that. Uh, it's like, but in the early, the early church, that, that, this is one of the ways that they would talk about themselves. So I, we are part of the way. And in fact, this is one of the ways you see early, later in Acts, when other people are talking about the church and other people are talking about Christians, they refer to it as the way. Well, what does that mean? This phrase shows two things. It shows two things. The first, it, it shows Exclusivity. The way, not a way, the way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's a pretty exclusive claim. <laughs> it's like, the way. And so Christians, that, that was one of the things. They were the way. And this is one of the reasons why they were so persecuted. They were so persecuted because they wouldn't budge when it came to Caesar worship. They, wouldn't in the, they were persecuted by the Romans because they wouldn't even light a little bit of incense towards Caesar. They're like, we won't do that. That's one of the reasons why they were persecuted, because they were part of the way. There was an exclusivity there. Now, I know exclusive claims in our day and age are hard to make, and people are very skeptical towards them. In fact, I had a conversation recently where someone's like, I just have a hard time with thinking that Jesus is the way. And that's understandable. And one of the things is like, I don't even know all the religions. I can't investigate every single thing. And, and you know what? That's true. You cannot, if you just said, I'm going to investigate every religion and then come back to Christianity, well, you're going to die before you finish that task. It's impossible. But if you take the claims of Jesus at face value, that if he is the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through him. It's like you have thousands and thousands and thousands of doors in front of you, and you could start opening every single one and then come back to that one, come back to the Jesus door. Or you could take his words at face value and open up that door and see what's inside. And if it's true, you don't need to go open every single door anymore. You know, if the claims are true, it's like, okay, I'm going to start with this door. You open it up, and you find the promises of Jesus to be true, which I think you will. You don't have to backtrack and check thousands of doors before you do it. So start with that door. It's the way. The second thing that commentators point out is it's not just an exclusive way. It is also a way of life. I mean, the way is used to mean the way of Jesus, but it's also used in other contexts to mean this is a way of living. This is a, it's an actual path that you walk on. Sometimes we get so confused as if, uh, because we think you're not accepted by Jesus, you're not loved by Jesus, you're not saved by Jesus, whatever word you want to use by what you do, which is true, and we get a lot of that from the, this guy's conversion. Paul writes a ton about that. But if we say you're not saved by what you do, by being a good person, by doing religious things, 
And then we conclude, therefore, you don't do anything in following Jesus. That is a false conclusion. Those t- You're not saved by what you do, but you are saved to do something, which we see as we continue to study this passage. It says in verse 3, but Saul was ravaging the church and entered house to house. He dragged off men and women. And then verse 4, we see again another word used. Christians are the body. Christians are the body. This is what it says. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So so imagine Saul going and he's riding on his donkey towards Damascus. And then all of a sudden, a bright light shines. Oftentimes when it's depicted as seeing God, it's, it's depicted as a bright light, as in we're, we're, he's so glorious and so perfect, and that light emanates, and we can't even look at him. And he hears a voice, why are you persecuting me? Like, who, who are you? Well, who's you? He knows, he says, Lord, he knows this voice is divine. It's thundering and the light. He's, he's read descriptions like this in Isaiah. It's like he's read descriptions like this. He knows enough to identify this as the Lord. But he's having a hard time understanding, what do you mean by persecuting me? That's why he's asking the question. He knows Lord, but what do you mean by persecuting me? And then the hammer drops. You're persecuting me. Because I'm Jesus. Like everything he's doing is going against Christians, those who claim the name of Jesus, and he says, you're persecuting me. Well, I want to think about that for a second. If I go, if I walk up just right now and I pinch Owen, okay, and just pinch him, he's going to say, ow, okay? Well, maybe, or punch me. I don't know what he's going to do. Okay, he's going to have some sort of reaction. But it'd be weird if I pinched Owen, and then back there, Joe said, ow. Wouldn't that be kind of weird? (laughs) It'd be like, did anybody watch the cartoon Dragon Brothers as a kid? No? Okay, man. It's just this weird 90s cartoon where two brothers had double the power, but also when you hurt one brother, you hurt the other one. (laughs) It's like, it's a lame. Don't look it up. Okay. (laughs) But it's, but it would, if I pinch uh, Owen, he would say, ow. It'd be weird if Joe just screamed out, ow. So think of this. Jesus is saying, you're persecuting me. Well, what is that? It means that all that persecu- persecution towards Christians was persecuting Jesus. It's like you, you hurt the Christians, you hurt Jesus. You hurt Jesus, you hurt the Christians. Why is this the case? Because we are his body. We are his body. To hurt us is to hurt him. To hurt him is to hurt us. That's who we are. Now, if you understand this, I had a hard time even thinking about an application of this because it's so it's so vast. So vast. But here's just one. When you are interacting with a, a fellow Christian within this within this church or within another church, you're interacting with Jesus' body. And you should think of it that way. When I'm talking to this person, in a sense, I am talking to Jesus. When I'm talking of this person, when they're not around, in a sense, I'm talking of Jesus. When I'm thinking about this person, and it's, it's like so closely tied And there should be this reverence towards God's body. Him too, towards Jesus, but also to his body. Because in in the scriptures, and here's just one example of many, they're indistinguishable. They're tied together. We should think about this all the time. There's so many implications. Christians, we are his body. That's our identity. The next thing we see here is Christians are disciples. 
disciples. Now we, uh, let's, uh, let's go to verse 10. Now there are, was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. To Saul, in verses uh, 6 through 9, he can't see. He is blind. He's stumbling around. The people around him are trying to figure out what happened. They s- heard Paul interacting with somebody, but they just are like, what's going on? So then it cuts to Damascus. And there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord said to him, he came to him in a vision. Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. Behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named um, Ananias and come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So he's saying that if you go to this street, you're going to then go to this house. There's a man there who has also received a vision. So he's going to to be uh, knowing that someone's going to knock on the door. I almost said looking for you, but that's not true because he's not looking for anyone at this point. He can't see. So he's going to knock on the door. He's going to know you're you're going to be there, and you're going to pray for him so he can regain his sight. But here and earlier at verse 1, Acts 9, chapter er, Chapter 9, verse 1, the same word for Christians is used, disciple, disciple. Christians are disciples. Ananias was a disciple who received a vision. Paul was persecuting disciples. And now Paul has become a disciple of Jesus. Now, what does it mean for Christians to be disciples? Disciples means one who learns or a pupil. One who learns or is a pupil. Meaning when the disciples traveled with Jesus, they were like traveling with a rabbi, learning from the ways of Rabbi Jesus. And now when we follow Jesus, we are learning from the ways of Jesus. We are learning intellectually. What does he say? How does God think? And we're learning experientially. What does it mean to live like that? What does it mean to apply what we have learned into what we think? One thing, a pet peeve of mine, when it comes to modern Christianity, some of the ways we talk has perpetuated pet peeves within me. And one of the things that people will say, which is true-ish, is, you know, Christians nowadays, we have so many resources, we have so many resources, and we just need to learn how to obey. And that is true. We have the internet. We have so many, we do have so many resources at our disposal. But it, it, it perpetuates this idea that modern Christians know a lot compared to Christians in the past. And that's not even remotely true. One of the reasons why, we do, why it reflects in our behavior, we don't live out the Christian life, is because we are just ignorant. We do not know. When Mark was a junior in college, little over a year from when he became a Christian, he was in a a class, uh, American history, American history class. And in this this class in a secular campus, they were talking about child rearing and child development. And one of the examples of just horrible child, child rearing and development that they were using were the these evil Puritans, you know, and they had an example of the way the Puritan children would think. Just read it and look how horrible it is. And he brought, we were meeting over coffee and he's like, hey, look at this, this in the, bless you, look at this in the textbook, bless you again. And it's like, and he's looking at it, this textbook, and I read it and I was thinking the same thing he was thinking, that is such a beautiful thing. And I saved it. I'm like, this is going to be in a sermon someday. And today is that day. Uh, It's like, but I want to read it. This is is a letter from Samuel Mather to his father, Cotton Mather. And he is, I'm going to, actually, I'm not going to tell you how old he is. I want you to guess how old he is. This is what it says. Though I am thus well in my body, yet I question whether my soul doth prosper as my body doth. For I perceive yet to this very day little growth in grace, and this makes me question whether grace be in my heart or no. 
I feel also daily great unwillingness to do good duties and great unruling of sin in my heart, and that God is angry with me and gives me no answers to my prayers. But many times he even throws me down uh, as dust in my face, and he does not grant my continual request for the spiritual blessing of the softening of my hard heart. In all this, I could yet take some comfort, but that it makes me wonder what God's secret decree concerning me may be. For I doubt whether ever God is wont to deny grace and mercy to his chosen, though uncalled, when they seek unto him by prayer for it, and therefore seeing he doth thus deny it to me. I think that the reason of it must be like, because I belong not unto the election of grace. I desire that you would let me have your prayers, as I doubt not, but I have them. Okay, think about that. Now, I know the old English throws something. There are a lot of doths. We need to reclaim that word, you know. Uh, let's, let's take all the Gen Z lingo and just add a few doths. And he is writing. He is writing this, and he's wrestling with his conversion. He's wrestling with hardness of heart. He's wrestling with the will of God, both the secret will and the decreed will of God. He, he's wrestling with the signs of a true Christian and whether he, it's seen in his life. He's wrestling with prayers and when God answers prayers and when it seems like God doesn't answer prayers. He's wrestling with all these very weighty things. All at the same time, at the age of 12. That is written by a 12-year-old. We are idiots. <laughs> it's, the thing is, and this is true of everyone, including us as Christians. Like, we just do not understand the scriptures at all. We're like not even close. And this is a 12-year-old wrestling through some of the most complicated issues that the scriptures present us in a very cogent and informed way. And not in a way that's like heady as if he's trying to prove something. He's writing to his dad for advice and prayer. This is not him trying to show off to his eighth grade English teacher. This is just a genuine prayer. This would be a text to Cotton Mather, his dad. Like this is what... We need to reclaim what it actually means to be pupils of Jesus, disciples of God, where we learn, we learn these things. Think of the book of Romans. Modern Christians look at Romans, you're like, oh, that's so complex, working your way through Romans. Paul wrote Romans to a church he's never visited as the basics of a Christian life. I haven't been there, so I'm just going to start at the ground floor and build up from there. We are in a very poor place. And all of our ignorance is willful. We need to reclaim what it means for Christians to be disciples. The next thing we see are Christians are saints. This is what Ananias, so Paul, or God comes to Ananias with the vision, go and get Saul. And Ananias is like, but Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done. It's like, don't you know who this guy is? I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And he says, he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. He, he asks an honest question. Now God is patient with him. He, he shouldn't have addressed God in the vision like this, but God is patient. But he says, this guy has hurt. And then he uses another word for Christians, saints. Saints. And he doesn't say saints as in the special group within the Christians. He uses it in a way of like all those Christians in Jerusalem. And in fact, it's all the Christians that fled because if we remember from what we read previously, all the apostles are still in Jerusalem. So it's not even including the apostles. And if they're going to be this, this elect group of, within the church, they would be included in that. But it's like oh, all these Christians that are fleeing Jerusalem, being persecuted, they're called saints 
Another modern misconception that we have is that a saint is like this elite task force within the church. It's like, first, if you're a Christian, you're like Peter Parker. And to become a saint is like getting bit by a spider. And now you're a saint. <laughs> it's like, and you get this super status, and eventually you'll get your own day and your own candle. And that's how you know. That's how you know you've made it. It's like, that is not what we see in the scriptures. Saint is used as, as a word to all Christians, to all Christians. For example, in, um, uh, Paul used this to refer to all Christians within his letters. The same guy uses it to refer to all Christians in his letters. And I, I think one of the big misconception is we understand saint and who's a saint within the church because we understand how to become the church. We, 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 we don't understand which Christians are saints because we don't understand how to become Christians. Saint means to be set apart, to be made holy, to be made blameless. If you be, view becoming a saint as in you're just superhero Christian and you do all these things and you do all, you walk on this path, elite level, and then you become a saint, well, what, what, the way you view becoming a Christian is you just clean yourself up. You just do all these things. You just start climbing the ladder towards God, and eventually you'll level up to the place where you're at saint level. That is not the description we receive. Penned by the very guy we're learning about, Saul. He writes this to the Corinthian church. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, Jesus becomes sin and he receives our punishment. And what he does is he offers us his righteousness. Now, what is that righteousness? It's perfection. It's blamelessness. Completely good, nothing bad. What is that? That's saint status. That's saint status. It's the status of Jesus offered to us, not because we have done anything. It says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us in Romans. While we're going against him, he dies for us. He gets punished for us. And it, by faith, he offers us saint status. You can be blameless. You can be set apart. Not because of what you have done that defeats the point of being a saint. It's not leveling up. It's receiving the level of Jesus because he died on your behalf. So in faith, we just trust what Jesus has done, and we receive from him complete consecration, complete blamelessness, complete righteousness. So we stand before God, and we are not punished, but we are forgiven, we are made new, we are clean. That's what it means to be a saint. If you're a Christian, right now, you are a saint. Most of us, probably none of us, will get a candle, but we are saints. We are saints. Then he continues, verse 14, and here he has authority. This is, again, Ananias saying this to God. This Saul has authority from the chief priest to bind all. And then he says one other thing. He has the authority to buy all who call on your name, who call on your name. Christians are those who call on his name. Again, this is not a, fr a phrase we use a lot as modern Christians. If someone's like, what do you believe? I'm like, I'm one of those who call on his name. <laughs> it's like, again, it's like the way. It's like, oh, that's, it sounds weird. But it, this is used a lot throughout the New Testament, throughout Acts and other places. In fact, the church starts on Pentecost when Peter stands out in front of the crowds he quotes Joel and he says, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Like, what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be a Christian? It means to call on the name of the Lord. Or Paul, same guy we're learning about his conversion. He pins this again to the Corinthian church. He says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, same words that we just learned about, saints, together with all those who in every place 
call upon the name of the Lord, Jesus, both their Lord and ours. He says, I'm writing you to Corinth. All of you messed up people in Corinth. If you read the letter of Corinth, you're saints. And this is what I know about you. You have called on the name of the Lord. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means that at one point in time, you realize that you couldn't do it yourself and that Jesus has done it for you and you just called out for mercy. You called out for mercy. Peter writes about the same thing. He says, baptism which now saves you. And he says, not the water which washes the body, but a calling upon the, a calling upon the Lord for a clean conscience in First Peter. Like that's what it means to be a Christian is to call out on God. And you know what? He loves answering that call. He loves answering that call. It's like he always opens when the door is knocked. He, he wants to know us, and he wants us to know him. He, he is not sitting back. He, he's, he's not sitting back and like, I don't know about that. You know, it, it's, ah, that person wants to come in? No, that's not, he, that's not the way he is. He answers the call. And we call, and he changes us. That's what it means to be a Christian. The next one we see is verse 15. But the Lord said, go, he said, Ananias, go. I know you're scared, go. There he is, a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of of Israel. God knows, he's patient with us, and he knows often what we need is to know the mission. What's the goal here? And he just tells him, this guy, I know you're scared, but this guy is a chosen instrument for me. A chosen instrument. Christians are a a chosen instrument. Now this verse is referring to Paul exclusively as the apostle to the Gentiles. But the same word is used by Paul in his letters to refer to all Christians. We are chosen instruments. We are chosen instruments to be used I'm going to make this brief, but a lot of our lives, a lot of our lives don't make sense because we don't realize that we actually have a purpose to and it's something to accomplish. Like, I'm about to use a sports analogy, so it means 10% of you are going to get it and 90% of you are going to be wondering what's going on. But it's like that famous interview with Allen Iverson, and he's like, practice? Again, 10% 10 of you, I could get it, I get it. He's like complaining about, what do you mean practice? You're complaining that I don't practice hard enough? And he's like, what about the games? Well, Christians, we often live as if all of life is just practice with no games. And we think it's aimless and purposeless. And what's the point? When God actually has a purpose for you to accomplish. Like God, God says, go and make disciples in all nations, meaning every single one of you, there's nobody on the sideline, every single one of you has been invited to be used by God. Do it. Like be, be used by God. You're a chosen instrument. If God saves you from something, he saves you to something as well, to his mission. There's no opting out. There's no opting out. And you might say, well, I just can't do that. <laughs> I don't have the strength to do that. I don't have the power to do that. How do I do that? Well, the next one is this. Christians are filled with the Spirit. Christians are empowered by the Spirit. Verse 16, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed. He goes to the house. He goes in. He prays uh, for for Paul, and it says, which came, he sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul becomes a Christian, is filled with the Holy Spirit. All of these things that is described for Christians is not something that we muster. It is something that God musters within us from the inter- inside out. We can, we can go about confidently, not, not in our own abilities, but in the abilities of the Spirit to empower us to what is coming in front of us. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be empowered by God, And the last thing is this, Christians are redeemed. Christians are redeemed. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And he took food and it strengthened him. Like that, 
Paul becomes a Christian and he takes the mark of a Christian in baptism. If you were thinking of the most prominent early church leader, you would not think of someone who murdered Christians. But God has a way of redeeming stories. That's what he does. He redeems stories. Just this week, just two beautiful examples of this. We, we had some people visiting the church, a husband and wife, and you get to know them and talking to them. And I realized that both of them are on their second marriage. Both of them, their spouses died while they had kids. They're, so they were both single parents. One was on the mission field when this happened. The husband was on the mission field. He came back with his two kids. And his wife lost her husband to leukemia. And for some weird reason, she's like, I, a single mom shouldn't be a missionary, but I feel like I should. I feel like I should be trained. So she's at a local college being trained to be a missionary. And she's like, I'm a single mom. This makes no sense. Until to some mutual friends introduced them to one another. And they got married, and they were missionaries together. And it was just such a heartbreaking, just hearing them both talk about their former spouses, but so liberating that God, like, God redeems stories. Then we had another guy come, uh, we're, we're meeting together, and a guy wanted to meet them, who was a pastor in Connecticut, and he comes, and we're meeting him for the first time. He sits down for coffee, and I'm like, tell your, tell your story, he's Joe, Pastor Joe. And he said, he, this guy has planted five churches in Connecticut, seen God do a lot of things. This is how he became a Christian. He's like, this is the way he started. I was homeless in Chicago. Someone shared the gospel with me, and I became a Christian. I moved back to New England in Connecticut, my hometown. And from there, he's planted five churches. Redemption. Redemption. So it doesn't, a lot of what holds us back is like, okay, I know you have a new identity as a Christian, but this in my past happened, or this happened to me, or I did this. And we remember Saul, the murderer, who becomes the greatest apostle and the greatest missionary in church history. God redeems all that. Let's leave it behind and move forward to the identity that God wants us to live out. We're going to take communion. We're going to worship. And I, I want you, one of the reasons why we do that, we take communion, then worship a, after hearing the word, is this way of reflecting and saying, okay, a lot of things were said, what do I need to take? Like, what do I need to take right now? So I want, I'm going to re, reread through them. The church, the gathering, the way, the body, disciple, saint, those who call on his name, chosen instrument, filled with the Holy Spirit, redeemed, okay, which, which, that's true, if you're a Christian, that's true of every single one of you, which one do you need to reflect on, which one do you need to walk through Vegas and five, every five minutes remind yourself of, <laughs> it's like, what, what, did it, what, what do you need to internalize, or if you're here and you're not a Christian, what is the next step, I would say call on his name, call on his name, and we'll be changed by it. And we'll have new identities. And we'll live out those identities. Let's pray.